I want to welcome you all to our membership luncheon sponsored by Mid-Columbia Libraries. I'm Lori Matson. I'm President and CEO of the Tri-City Regional Chamber. We're thrilled to announce that our attendance at today's luncheon is the largest in our history, selling out with over 900 reservations. Hopefully we don't have two to a seat, right? How many of you are two to a seat? I would like to sincerely thank General Jim Mattis for accepting our invitation to keynote the luncheon. We are honored to host you and sincerely appreciate your generosity. General Mattis, will you please stand as we express our gratitude for your service and sacrifice to our country. In addition to recognizing General Mattis, we would like to have all of the veterans that are here today stand so we can recognize you as well. Please stand, veterans. Oh my gosh. Wow. Thank you so much. All right, we're not done. Also, anyone who is serving or has served in the armed forces, please stand. And now I'm going to bring up the chair of our board, Derek Stricker, to lead us through the rest of the program. But before I do that, I, um, this morning today's been a big day. Not only do we have this amazing luncheon today and our esteemed speaker, this morning was our final board meeting of 2019. And so, Derek, in one day, your final board meeting is chair and your final luncheon is chair. And I just want to recognize and thank Derek for his leadership this year. He has such a passion for our community and for all of your businesses. And um, I just want to recognize him in front of all of you. Thank Thank you. Derek? Thank you very much, Lori, and thank you, everyone who's came today. Oh, what a special time it is right now in the Tri-Cities. Here, I'm going to readjust this right here. Perfect. We have so much to be thankful for in this ever-growing community. As Lori said, I've been serving as a chamber board chair this year, and what a year we've had. We literally started off the year with women in business in January, set an attendance record of 800 plus people. That's how January started. That was my icebreaker into this role as well. Now we're wrapping up the year in December with a sold out crowd of, what, 900 plus in the audience? Uh, I want to say 1,000, but I hear the fire marshals in the audience today, so 900 plus it is. <laughs> no code violations, please. All right, I want to thank the chamber and the community uh, for having me be your chairman this year. Uh, it's been an honor. I took it seriously and honestly something I've wanted to do since I moved back from Chicago in 2011. Uh, the work that the chamber is doing is literally changing our region. And as part of the next generation, if you will, that excites a lot of us in this area. There's a lot of great things that have happened and just with the, the new emphasis, we're very proud of where we're all going right now. Uh, I'm very proud of the chamber team and the staff and all of our members who are here today, our chamber members, fill in the room, pack the audience, maybe next year when you go, you know, stadium seating or double decker, I think. So right now though, I want to thank you for what you guys do day in, day out for the Tri-Cities. I kind of think this is our cherry on top for the year we have right now, this event right here. Uh, so very honored, very honored to introduce the man of the hour, but before doing so, Oh, hey, Sloan. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> On-site learning, I like it. Uh, but before doing so, I task you when General Mass is speaking to write down, text yourself, something you learned from today from him and how you can apply it day one in 2020. All right, so due to exceptional turnout today, we imagine many of you will have questions for General Mattis. Following his keynote, you're invited to find one of the four microphones stationed throughout the room uh, in the audience. Please keep your questions brief and allow others the same opportunity you have. General Mattis needs no introduction. However, when you have a four-star general in the house, you make an introduction. Jim Mattis was raised in southeastern Washington and graduated from Central Washington State College. There it is. He served over 40 years in the Marine Corps as an infantry officer, 
plus duty in the office of the Secretary of Defense as NATO's Supreme Allied Commander and as Commander of the U.S. Central Command, comprised of over 250,000 U.S. and Allied troops to combat across the Middle East and South Asia. Retiring in 2013, he was a Davies Family Scholar at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Subsequently, he served as the 26th Secretary of Defense from January 2017 through December 2018. Tri-Cities, please help me welcome our hometown hero, General Jim Mattis. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, what a great day. I never get used to this. I'm just another Richland guy who went off, wandered around the world. And uh, it just I love coming back here. All America is is about a couple thousands of communities like this, where from international businesses to small businesses, to all the local people who get together and commit to this community. Uh, and it's a reminder, as I'm very fond of saying, having just returned from uh, Washington, D.C. about two days ago, uh, we are better than our politics that we see on the screen. We are a lot better than our politics. <clears throat> um, coming back, I, I arrived at the airport over in Pasco, and I immediately went up to the first policeman I saw and requested political asylum coming out of Washington, D.C. He was very helpful and allowed me to stay here. So that's why I'm here today. I will say that Lori and Elizabeth, my two bosses uh, for this event, they're the, the greatest bosses you could ever come up with. A lot of fun working with them and to be here and spend a few minutes with you today as we all remind ourselves just how fortunate we are to live in this little piece of heaven out here in southeastern Washington. I'm a very, uh, with no false modesty, I'm a very average graduate of our high school. I have a lot to be humble about, by the way, in terms of my academic credentials. Uh, and I would just tell you that I try to avoid a lot of these kinds of talks. I turned down probably 98 percent, but no way do you turn down your hometown, if you know what I mean. You stay fond of it forever. It's like the first girl you ever kissed. You never forget it, and you always want to get back to it, you know? Um, I, I would also just say that I was in that luckiest generation, and why do I call it that? Because we were grazed by the greatest generation, the generation that went through a depression without losing their dignity and affection for one another, that went through a bloody, awful war and defeated fascism, and then raised all of us in this town with values that allowed me to go all around the world, uh, to meet uh, from privates uh, in the Marine infantry to kings and prime ministers, and treat them all the same, because that's just the way we were brought up here. There was no class distinction. There was nothing about the kind of rabid uh, language we see used in some campaigns nationally. Here we were brought up, uh, I would just say, in the best of all worlds. Uh, and I hope that we're doing our part, people with my color hair, to do the same for the younger generation coming up today. I was told that I had to speak about leadership and the interesting thing about leadership is you never stop learning leadership. Every time you go into a leadership position, whether it be in your family, your, your sports team, your organization, your police department, your corporation, your college, no matter where you're at, you have to learn it all over again. It's all about shifting chemistries and shifting missions and shifting environments. And when you put that together, uh, and you're somewhat successful, you achieve some modest success, we kind of owe it to everyone else to run the elevator back down and teach the young people what we learned along the way. And it's in that spirit I come here today to talk about this. Not that I know everything about leadership, but just to pass on the lessons that I learned. And after all, uh, I was not in the Marine Corps for 40 plus years. I was in the U.S. Marine Corps. We answer to you, you, we, you own us, and we are accountable to you. So I come here also reminded that you paid my, paid my wages for the last 40 some years, so this is the least I can do for the hometown <clears throat> that I'm so fond of. I didn't like a lot of the jobs in the Marine Corps. I think that's one point about leadership. It doesn't matter whether you like the specific moment or not. 
A leader's job is to take care of problems. I grew to hate minefields very, very young in the U.S. Marine Corps. <clears throat> the idea that people would actually poison the ground you walk on is a reminder of just how malicious uh, mankind can be. But one thing I realized while I was in those minefields, wherever over many, many times over many years, <clears throat> I loved being around young sailors and Marines that would crawl forward into that minefield knowing as they probed looking for something they didn't want to find that if they missed it, either they or their buddies could end up dead and they kept right on going. And so as I got into an age when I got invited to go back and work one more time in government, all those lessons I'd learned came with me. We're all formed by those experiences. And initially when I'd gone into the Marines, I was convinced I was going to at least do my patriotic chore. Uh, the draft was on, and if I was going to go, it would be the Marines. I did not expect to rise to high rank. I wasn't sure I'd stay very long. I, I love this area. I love the hunting, the fishing, the swimming in the river. Uh, I actually thought about being a teacher, which probably surprises my teachers who had a heck of a time beating anything into my brain. Uh, but you know, we, you, you make plans, you, you go on about your life, and God has a good chuckle and says, watch this, baby. And they throw, he, then he throws something at you, right? And so I, there's a song that we, today it's so old, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to go on public TV to listen to it. And that's really old. It's by Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. And it was something about teach your children well. And there's one line in that song that said, you, when you're on the road, you must have a code you can live by. And I think that uh, I, without realizing it at the time, I was on the road, a leadership road, because the U.S. military demands leadership. Uh, its environment uh, requires it. And so when uh, God laughed at me when I said I was retired and tapped me, I got tapped on the shoulder, having taken no part in an election and brought back to be the Secretary of Defense, all those lessons I had learned the hard way came to the forefront. And at that point, I was prepared. But it was in no small part, ladies and gentlemen, due to the values I grew up with here in the Tri-Cities. Uh, values about getting along with each other, about working together, uh, about just enjoying life, life frankly. Uh, the worst kind of leader to be under in any organization is one who wakes up every day with a bad attitude. You don't want to be, even be around them because that attitude will seep down into the organization. With the, uh, I would just tell you that the Marines have a very strong institutional culture. I think you're aware of that. It's, it's naval in character. But like all organizations in the world, uh, the leadership of the Marine Corps gets the behavior they reward. And I want to say that again. Whatever your leadership rewards in your organization, that's the behavior you're going to get. If you want ethical behavior, you'll get it with a few, perhaps, disappointments at times. If you want unethical behavior, you'll get it. Eventually, an organization reflects the personality of the, uh, of the boss, of whoever is given the responsibility to be up at the top. In the Marines, the two behaviors they want most out of the young petty officers and NCOs in the Fleet Marine Force is initiative and aggressiveness. And I'll give you an example, uh, because you see the Marines being a naval force, when they land on a beach, there is no retreat. You either win or you die. And so there, you've got to have a lot of aggressiveness. It's a very young force. And I'll give you an example of what happens when things go wrong. I had a wonderful young uh, division on one occasion. Probably the average age of 23,000 sailors and Marines was somewhere around 22 years old, and that included old guys like me. Most of them were in their teens. And I had a computer guy, unbeknownst to me, who had fallen in love with another Marine. And so he sent her an email, hacked into my computer, and sent her an email from General Mattis to her saying, by the way, Private First Class so-and-so is the greatest Marine in the entire division. <laughs> well, she actually fell for it, and she immediately hit reply and sent me a note, which I kind of was surprised at, since I'd never met this young lady, and I'd never seen the email that she was replying on. So it took a Marine gunnery sergeant about 22 seconds to figure out what had happened, and the young fellow came in front of me, and great initiative, not the best judgment. A private first class does not want to see a two-star general having done something like this. Um, but he had shown good initiative, and he was young enough 
to make a mistake like that, which could have been an ethical mistake up above. For him, it was just mischief. And so recognizing this, he got punished by being assigned to my personal staff so I could keep an eye on the lad, <laughs> see what else he was up to. And he became actually very, very good at something called stopping hacking people getting inside our networks. You can imagine uh, with that background, he'd be good at that. So my point is you reward that behavior and you make sure you don't crush someone for a bad mistake when they're young. Because one of the most important things for a leader is to know the difference between a mistake and a lack of discipline. And if it's a mistake, then you've got to coach them better. Because I always saw myself as a coach more than a commander. You coach them. You get them better. You keep making them better. And if they make mistakes, coach them a little more, hug them a little closer. Now, if it's a lack of discipline, then that's different. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But basically, the Marine Corps drop kicks them through the goalposts of life if they're not disciplined, because you can't tolerate that. Because if you allow a lack of discipline to occur, then what, in effect, you're doing is you're setting a newer and lower standard. The, uh, I think that when you have an organization built for violence, like the Marine Corps, uh, and it's designed to protect our experiment that you and I call America, you, you have to have your own authentic way of dealing with the troops. You can't be, try and be someone else because you just be a copy and not a very good copy of that someone else. So when I chose the player coach as my way of doing uh, business with the troops, it would recognize that I could be a commanding general and command 10,000 or 25,000, 45,000, or eventually a quarter million in probably 15 minutes a day, sign an order, do something like that. The hard part was how do you coach them and allow everyone to feel that they're part, that they own the mission? How do you actually do that? What were the techniques of it? And so as I put more and more time into it, uh, what I found was I had to overcome any sense that young guys were staying awake at night thinking, how can I mess up Lieutenant Mattis's day tomorrow, or captain, or major? Sometimes I wondered about it, ladies and gentlemen, because they're pretty rambunctious lads that joined the Marine Corps. And they could get into a whale of a lot of trouble. And I'd be at, down there talking to somebody, you know, getting chewed out about it or something. But the fact is, the kind of people who climb hills when they're getting shot at and all are not always uh, milk toast kind of people. They, they get into wonderfully big scrapes at times. And you've got to really bear with them, because those are the values that you've actually got to have on the battlefield. And you try to corral it back in the rear, because they still have to be disciplined. What I found was an organization that was not disciplined in the rear, if they had DUIs, for example, or they had sexual harassment, or they have people who are not showing up at work on time, they're the same ones that in a firefight and combat have things going wrong. So I tried to figure out why was it that some organizations were worth more than similar organizations in a fight? What was it they, if they were disciplined? Why were some so much better? Why would a platoon of 40 sailors and Marines move smoothly against the enemy here, whereas a company was more brittle? And as I studied this over many, many years, what I found was the difference was a word called affection. They all had trust. They trusted each other. They all had the same equipment, the same training. But in some of those units, there was an affection for one another that even as people were getting shot down around them, they would continue to move against the enemy. And so how did organizations build that sort of bond, that affection? And some people were very good at it. I had a gunnery sergeant during a period when I lost half my troops around me out of 29 communicators and drivers and gunners in my little group, 17 of the 29 were killed or wounded. And yet the gunnery sergeant who was in charge of them, very smart, very tough guy, had a great sense of humor, and he was very adamant with them about you must meet the standard every day. If it was a rehearsal every day, everyone's there, we rehearse. Nobody gets sloppy. But at the same time, he could disarm the hottest day, the worst day, with, with some humorous words that reminded them that we were all human and we were going to get through it. And a human, uh, a sense of humor, I think, brought out that humanity. It was almost like putting armor or a flak jacket around their spirits so that they didn't feel like it was just, you know, it, it was as grim and as bad as combat can be, which scrapes that veneer of civilization right off people. 
The, uh, there's a former Marine named uh, Steve Pressfield who wrote a book called The Legend of Bagger Vance, and he compares golfing to life. And he said, you have to have your own authentic swing. And that gunnery sergeant had an authentic swing that he could walk up to a wounded guy going into shock and start joking with him and bring that guy back around right there. So how you maintain that connection, how do you really tie together with the people who are at the very front end? If you're a fire chief, how do you tie with the guys who are going to go up the ladders into a burning building? If you're out here in the, in the plant and you're working with people who've got to make certain the process is going to work right, or it's going to be on the front page of the New York Times because there's a, a leakage out in the Hanford cleanup site, you got to make sure they feel like they own their, their own plan. And the way I would make sure that on my level was I would not put a whole lot of details in my orders. I left a lot of room for them to write in how they were going to do, but I was very clear about what I wanted them to do. And then I wouldn't let them brief me on their entire plan. I didn't want to know their entire plan. There were a couple things I wanted to know. I wanted to know their communications plan so I wouldn't lose touch with that unit. I wanted to know their medevac plan so I knew how they were going to get their lads out if they got knocked down. And I wanted to know their reconnaissance plan so they wouldn't get ambushed. But when they started getting into more detail than that, I'd say, no, no, it's your plan. It's not the way I'd do it, but if you think it'll work, then you go for it. And that way, they never felt like the ownership of the plan went away to someone else. And I thought that was very, very important because once they feel like they own it, then a lot of your job as a senior uh, person is basically it just goes away like smoke in the wind because you know you can walk away and they're going to continue to carry out their plan. They know what they're doing. They wrote it. They believe in it. I think, too, that you have to have feedback loops, though. And I bring this up because there's nothing about benign neglect here. You've got to be out in the forward troops. You've got to have people out there who are reporting back to you because 99% of the information you need is somewhere in your organization. Have you really set up the opportunity for people to get that information up to you and displayed so everyone's operating off it? That was some of the most important stuff that I saw. And when I was working, it was like a well-oiled machine. It was almost like a ballet dance up on a stage. And you're standing back, and you're the director, and you're just watching it. And everyone knows what they're doing. Each one knows their part. And they know how they connect or not connect with someone else. And you just kind of stand back. I call it taking your hands off the steering wheel and let the young ones do it. But don't put too much word in your orders, or they'll feel like it's mother may I. They can't do something until this is approved or something like that. And opportunities, whether on a football field or a, a marketplace or anywhere, uh, a battlefield, they open and close very, very quickly. And young people who feel like you have their back, who feel like they can take a risk, then they'll go for it. The biggest challenge there is what uh, some people call one-way decisions. In other words, if it's a risk, you want to know exactly how much risk and who's going to take that risk and what can you do you know, to reduce the risk. But gambles, I always said gambles come up to my level. Gambles are not decided down below. Gambles are where if something goes wrong, you're going to lose the whole thing. If those come up to the corporate level in business or the chief level in public service or to uh, the general or the senior officer in the military, because a gamble is too big, of a, too big of a gamble, too big of a risk, especially when you're dealing with people's lives and potential defeat. I think, too, that uh, as you put all this together and you, and you, and you get it working and the, and the organization's hitting on all cylinders, you have to watch out for complacency. We're pretty soon they think we can do anything. And a lot of things go wrong at that point. Most important when things go wrong is that the boss takes responsibility. While you can delegate decision making down to lower people, the responsibility stays with you. If you're asleep in the ship and you're the captain, <clears throat> that ship runs aground, you're still responsible. So you've got to make sure the people on watch know what they're doing. Same thing in any other line of work. I think what you have to do is make sure that you have good feedback loops and don't fall into command and control to use a parlance that's grown out of the military right into political campaigns and businesses and all. Uh, the Marines teach us command and feedback because that's how you unleash people. They, you give it very clear guidance on here's what I want it to look like at the end and generally here's how we're going to do it. 
and then you go around and make sure you're getting feedback and keeping up with them. But don't get so, so uh, dictatorial that they don't feel like they can take advantage of those opening opportunities on the battlefield. Uh, because if you do, then it's going to be really tough. The last point I would make is, in, in my line of work, if you had an officer who was not as physically fit as their toughest troops, couldn't do as many pull-ups, run as fast or faster, uh, take a heavy load off a Marine who has the flu one day on a hike and, and double load on him. Uh, if you didn't have someone who was that tough, those were often the units where you had problems because right or not, very young males will often equate value to whether or not the other person can at least physically do what they do. It's the unfairness of leadership positions, but I had no room. Uh, fortunately, the Marine Corps doesn't promote weak lieutenants into the fleet marine force, but I had no room for, uh, for ones that were, uh, that were too, uh, too uh, I would just call it weak, uh, to go out in front and just be the toughest coaches there in the unit. Um, I also want to just make mention, we, we had the veterans stand up a little while ago, and I cannot tell you how many times my leadership was made easy because of what veterans did. Uh, in the Marine Corps where you have to study uh, war, uh, you're given reading lists at each rank. When you get promoted, you get a new reading list. We, we were taught that there was nothing we were going to be asked to do would be tougher than some other veteran had done. And I'll give you just one quick snapshot of this. At a time when we were preparing to assault the town and the two assault battalions that would be going into that city, we knew would be outnumbered by the number of people on the defense there. I won't go into why, it was just the situation we faced. So the night before, I go down to see the assault battalions, uh, the battalion commanders, and walk through the infantry companies and all, make sure they have everything they need. We had the artillery ready. We had the air support ready. We'd moved another hospital, mobile hospital in nearby to handle casualties quickly. So I go down to see the assault units, talking to them, and finally it's about midnight. It's time for generals to get out of the way and leave it to the young infantry guys the guys who are known infantry, infant soldier, young soldier, that's how they got their name. Most of them in their teens in the assault units under a few NCOs older and a couple of officers. And we, uh, I'm, I'm falling back in my vehicles and my, the enemy starts creating a problem right when we're behind the assault company that would go in before dawn and clear out the enemy outpost so the assault battalion could move into the city. Uh, and they were laying there, they were stripped down, it was a very cold night, they were stripped down to their combat gear, they had no sleeping bags or blankets or anything. And the enemy caused some problems and so I stopped and checked him with the corporal there. He said, no sweat, we'll take care of it. And we're laying there and the Marines took care of the problem and, and shot him up and, and that sort of thing. And so we're just laying there waiting to make sure it's all died down and one of the Marines thinking we'd moved on asked his corporal, who was probably maybe 21 years old, he says, Corporal, do you think Fallujah is going to be tough in the morning? And because we have ladies here, I'm not going to put it in quite the words of uh, the corporal response, but he said basically hush and get some sleep. We took Iwo Jima, Fallujah won't be nothing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he wasn't even a twinkle in his daddy's eye when Iwo Jima was taken by the Marines in World War II. But the raw example the tough fight for Iwo Jima uh, echoes, resonates back down through the ranks today of a Marine Corps that's taught its history. And so for all the veterans in the room, no matter where you served or what you did, I just want you to understand that you've continued to send that message to the young folks who are on the front lines now, the young men and women out there, even as we sit here today overseas and are fighting, that they face nothing worse than you or your predecessors faced. So thank you very much to all the veterans in the room. I owe you more thanks. I could not have given a speech as good as that young corporal could use an example from history to calm his troops down before they get ready to cross the line of departure. So let me stop there. I, wa I, I wanted, I promised the ladies I'd take, save time for questions. So let's just see uh, who's got the first questions. You can take it, you can talk about leadership or you can talk about anything on your mind, ladies and gentlemen. It's hometown and it's good to be back with you. Thank you very much. They'll come, you watch, it'll happen.
No one else will. Who, General Mattis, sir. Who's got the first one? Here, sir. Can you okay, hear me? go ahead. Um, Jack Drummond, uh, 1 5, 1st Marine Division. Uh, Ooh, General Mattis, would you be kind enough to let us know how you obtained the nickname Mad Dog Mattis? Thank you. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's really uh, not a very interesting answer. We were outside of a, of a city called Ramadi and we got stars and stripes one day. And one of the troops said, hey, General, they, they're calling you Mad Dog here. All I can tell you is a slow news day somewhere and somebody made it up. My call sign was always chaos. The way I got chaos was I commanded a regiment when I was a colonel out in the Mojave Desert and I was just brim full of great ideas. Um, and my operations officer uh, was from Brooklyn, had a rather uh, dry sense of humor. And one day I was down in his office. Uh, this is how I got my real call sign. And I had given him another great idea. And as I turned to walk out, I saw chaos written on his whiteboard. And I said, what's this about? You know, just curious. And he said, oh, you don't need to know about that. Well, oh, yes, I do. <clears throat> and so, um, so I persuaded him. Uh, I waterboarded him. Um, and, and he said, well, it means Colonel has another outstanding solution. And it was very tongue in cheek. They didn't think I had as many good solutions as, as perhaps they, uh, they were looking for. So I adopted it from my irreverent subordinates, uh, my call sign of chaos. But Mad Dog was never, that's made up by the press. It was never, the, the sailors, marines, that was never what they called me. It was always chaos. Uh, when they call on the radio, that's when they use it. They call for chaos. That's what they use. It wasn't Mad Dog. Sorry to disappoint you on that one. <laughs> Who else has a question? Go ahead. So thank you, General, for joining us today. Um, from a leadership standpoint, what, was, what do you think, as you look back, was the biggest mistake you made in leadership? And then how did you respond to it? You had a question about what's the biggest mistake. Um, well, one of them uh, is in there. I, I, I think at Tora Bora, if I'd done some things better, uh, notifying my boss that we were ready to go after Osama bin Laden in 2001, we might have been able to get him, but you, you never know. But uh, I didn't do as good a job there. Probably the biggest, it was a, it was a mistake in the sense I was not successful <clears throat> in persuading the higher command not to assault Fallujah at the time we did. Um, and what happened, ladies and gentlemen, was we'd had four contractors wander into the city. They'd been murdered by uh, civilian contractors, uh, and they never should have been in the city. It was, it was strongly held by the enemy. They were just lost. And I was ordered to attack into the city, and I said, we have a better way of doing it. We know who did this. There's tribes in the city that'll help us. We'll catch the guys who did it. We'll hunt them down and we'll kill them. We'll return the remains to their loved ones back in the United States. But I don't want to assault the city. Finally, in order to do so, I said, OK. And I said, but do not stop me once we start in. And then deep inside the city, we stopped. And the mistake was to stop at that point. I, didn't, I still didn't agree with the order to go. But when you're told to do it, it's called orders, not likes. And you give it 110%. That's what leaders do. Uh, so I said, okay, let's get on with it. And we went in, and then deep inside the city, our uh, political leadership got nervous and stopped us, and now I'm losing lads in house-to-house -house fighting, and I have to negotiate. Uh, I'm ordered to negotiate with them, and eventually ordered to withdraw. And now we hand the enemy a victory, a moral victory. They defeated the Marines. And I said, uh, we're gonna have to go back in, and when we did, it cost us hundreds killed and wounded. Uh, to take the city months later. So my, my failure was that I was unable to persuade people several layers above and get the, the word through those all the way to Washington that we had a better idea. Um, the Marines were interviewed, of course, by the embedded press, and I remember one young, slow-talking lad, a blonde-haired guy, filthy dirty with his light machine gun over his shoulder, and uh, newsman was saying, this must be terrible for you. You lost your buddies, <coughs> excuse me, you lost your buddies going into the city. You had to fight hard. Now you've been ordered to fall back. And the young guy, uh, the, the newsman was trying to get a real story out of, you know, that you know, everything was all bad. And 
He just looked into the camera and said, doesn't matter, we'll just hunt him down somewhere else and kill him. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, I know that sitting here in beautiful, peaceful uh, Tri-City, that sounded like some pretty crude language, but I could have kissed the kid right then that he hadn't lost faith in his chain of command and he was going to hold fast and keep loyal and not suck his thumb. Because in the military, we consider cynicism and we consider victimhood just to be a, another form of cowardice. And if he decided that, well, you know, there's nothing I can do about this, there is, hunt him down somewhere else and get him. He knew exactly what he ought to do. He might have been a teenager, but he had wisdom beyond his years, and he kept faith in a chain of command that certainly could have shaken his faith if he didn't believe in it. So as always in the Marines, uh, I was saved by those good NCOs and junior officers who represented that very difficult political decision in the most positive terms and said, doesn't stop us. We're still in control of how we react to this, and we're not going to suck our thumbs. We'll hunt them down somewhere else. So that's an example of what, how an organization with that's it's got good, strong loyalty and devotion inside it can save you when, as a leader, you fail to get the message through up above, and they have to pay a price. So that I hope that it, where where you at here? Does that that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, and most important thing is when things don't go your way, you still got to do it. I had to go into the city when I went, didn't want to, and the lad had to pull out with his buddies when he didn't, and that still doesn't relieve you from staying positive, no sucking your thumb, no getting cynical, no, none of that sort of victimhood stuff. Where's, uh, who's got um, another question? Wave I have an arm. a question a on leadership, Jim. Okay. Um, over here. Thank you. The question is, um, how do you prepare your people um, to carry out orders with an independent invest investment. I mean, how do you get them on the approach to that investment? What kind of values do you bring to that? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Uh, the way uh, George Washington did it, I, it still works, I think. His was very methodical. He called it, you, you listen first, so you have to listen to your people, and they will tell you what they're unsure about if they trust you. It, trust is the coin of the realm here. And you learn from them. Don't just listen long enough to rebuff them or to say, okay, I hear all that, but here's what we're going to do anyway. Learn from them. So you listen and you learn, and by doing that, you show respect. And then you help them. If they tell you, gosh, I think we're really going to take casualties here, say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to move two more battalions of artillery up, and I'm going to reduce the chance of that happening. So you actually learn to how to help them. And then you lead them to be, I would just say, uh, to have confidence in themselves and to take, and to take um, not to listen to their doubts, listen to their beliefs. Uh, the way you do that is adopted from Confucius by the Marines. It used to be part of their recruiting slogan. And we used to say the Marine Corps builds men back in the 1950s, body, mind, and spirit. So you want people who are physically very strong so they feel confident. You want people who are mentally sharp, and that's why you require them to read certain things, uh, body, mind, and, and then the spirit comes. And in the Marine Corps, the spirit is actually a weapon system. You could have reversed the weapons I had in many of the battles I was in. Given the enemy our weapons, we could have taken theirs. We still would have won. Probably would have lost more people. We still would have won. So uh, you build them up, body, mind, and spirit, so they're individually, they feel confident, then you listen, you learn, you help, and then you lead. And as you do that, if you've got someone who just needs a little more attention, then be close to them. I, I can remember on one occasion, in the middle of a fight, I managed to get my battalion surrounded in the middle of the open desert, and in the middle of all the chaos of what was going on, I remember just looking over my shoulder, and there was a full colonel, probably no more than 2,000 meters away, watching the whole thing, not intruding at all, but just ready if I needed it. We didn't. It was fine. But just move up and be close enough that people feel your presence, but not, your, not being oppressive or dictating things unless it's really gone bad. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Sure. It's hard to see you all out there with the lights on you up here, by the way. So uh, if I look like I'm looking the wrong direction, I probably Good afternoon. My name is Jeremiah Griffith. I'm the president of the Mid-Columbia Master Singers. I'm to your right, about 30 feet away. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. I have a question regarding um, critical conversations or crucial conversations. Um, what are some kind of pearl of wisdom that you could give us regarding talking to people that maybe aren't your subordinates um, so we can better communicate in that realm? No, who aren't your subordinate, like maybe a leader or something of that nature, where you have to have a crucial conversation. What is the tools that you use for that? Yeah. Okay. So if you if you have a let, let me give you an example. I'm Secretary of Defense, and I have to go to NATO. Okay. And NATO hasn't been paying as much money as they should. This goes back about 30 years, and I had to go there and I had to talk to them about you've got to pay more. Uh, that's all there is to it. You can't continue to ask, as I put it to them, uh, you can't continue to ask the American parents to care more about your children's freedom than you're willing to care. Th those days are over. You've got to come on board here. Uh, we're with you, but you've got to work with us on it. What I would do then is follow up on that, and I'd sit down with them and say, what is the problem that, w that you can't do this? What, what is doing this? In other words, first I had to understand the issue as well or better than the person who might want to argue against me. And I bring this up, ladies and gentlemen, because right now there's an awful lot of people who just listen long enough to say, I don't agree with you. It's happening in our own country. It, it worries me greatly. How much, what's greatly? I am less concerned right now about the Chinese or the Russians doing something to our country than I am about Americans and the way they're treating each other in terms of when they disagree they don't wait long enough to, to really understand each other. Uh, I would know an argument of someone that I had to influence. I always tried to know the argument even better than they did for their position. I wanted to know their argument so well that I could argue it. And then I would address it. And sometimes, guess what? I found I was the one in the wrong by doing that. In other words, you're not just learning enough in order to rebuff them, you're learning enough to, to actually advocate for them. And at that point, you're in a lot better position to agree on the problem statement. And if you don't agree on the problem statement, you will never agree on the solution. Because when someone rolls out a solution, and you're looking at it and saying, that's not my problem. You're, you're not addressing what's, what's causing me a problem in doing this. And so I think that most of all, it just I think the Native American would say you just walk in someone else's moccasins, you know, for a mile. Just trade over to them. And remember that even the people you disagree with might be right uh, and be a little humble about it. And from that point, you'll find common ground. And once you find the common ground, it may not be much, but I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I've found common ground with people who don't speak our language, and I've seen young Marines do it. I've seen, I'll give you an example. One night we're at Kandahar, and a lot of the Marines were off in the high country, and then we get the word we're going to get attacked. So I go to the local Afghan commander, the CIA brought him in, I said, I need my perimeter on this airfield reinforced. He says, got it. This is in the mid-morning. By afternoon, he and his uh, turbaned you know, guys are walking through, and every Marine fighting hole now has an Afghan kid in it. And the guy who's doing this, a guy named Galali, any of you have read The Bear Went Over the Mountain, he's the 13-year-old back when the Soviets invade who kills the Russians. He's my counterpart there. And Galali and I, and I were standing there watching this one Marine, and the guy got in the hole, and they kind of shyly shake hands with each other. Neither one speaks the same language as the other. It's going to get dark soon. They're going to get attacked. They're going to be fighting together. And the young guy puts his AK-47 up and he's pointing it. And, and a Marine shakes his head no and he points to the belt of ammunition and puts his hands on it that he's to help him shoot his machine gun. And the kid, obviously been in fights, they're both young, both in their teens, nods. And so then he shows if he runs out of ammo, then he points to the rifle and puts the stakes there, puts it up against the stakes so that he knows where to shoot at night when he can't see. Like we didn't have night vision goggles for all those guys. And, and the kid nodded. Then they both sat back, and the young Afghan kid picked up the paintbrush, started dusting off all the machine gun links so it'd be nice and clean for when they had to use it that night. There were two guys from the opposite ends of the earth who did not actually, uh, you know, one was not in command of the other. They were going to be in a fighting hole all night together fighting. 
and they were able to make common cause right there with hand and arm and pointing to things and nodding to each other and shaking hands. I wish I could see that same level of collaboration at times in our nation's capital, if you know what I mean. Does that answer your question, give you an idea there? Find common ground and then work from there, okay? Who else has a question? Sir, I have a question. Okay. Where are you? Thank you. Oh, he's going to let me go. Sorry. Um, okay. I'm Madison with Mid Columbia Libraries, and I noticed earlier you are a Hemingway fan. So, which title is your favorite and why? No, which title is your favorite from Hemingway? Probably Islands in the Stream. That pass, I mean, you know, what, what's a librarian think of that one? <laughs> well, lucky for you, I'm not a librarian. I'm a graphic designer. But, <laughs> so, but any title by him is excellent, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Why? Whew. That was a tough one. <laughs> so Other I questions? Question. Here to your left. Sir, uh, my name is Lieutenant Heisey. I'm with 217 Field Artillery at JBLM. Um, I apologize to the audience if this question doesn't interest all of them. Um, my question has to do with the artillery-infantry relationship. In my two years, I've noticed that the artillery seems to have a disconnect with the infantry, how they move, how they train. And my question, sir, is how do we improve that relationship? Well, I think it applies to anyone in the room because there's times, I mean, how do you keep for example, a police department and fire department working together as a team, or how do you keep the librarians at the public library working with the school librarians? I mean, it's all, it's all about collaboration. Uh, I've, I've seen nothing in this world that can be satisfied in isolation. Uh, with the artillery, though, I, I would just say that uh, the more you can have some of the artillery guys spend some time with the infantry in the front line, understanding why sometimes their voices are three octaves higher uh, calling for artillery, or the infantry guys can go back to artillery and see what it's like to have to manhandle 155 millimeter shells into a cannon that they're firing as fast as they can pull the lanyards. I think anything you can do to share the experiences uh, in any organization, that's the right way to do it. You, it is very hard, I think it was Will Rogers who said, it's very hard to dislike somebody once you've met them. And that's sometimes not true. Every once in a while there's a real jerk out there, okay? <clears throat> you know, I, I, I've said it before, and I think in this town, but remember even Jesus of Nazareth had one out of 12 go to crap on him, okay? <laughs> so once in a while you just got, you got somebody bad. But by and large, if you, bring, if you bring your infantry and artillery guys together in each other's domains, they very quickly will, will learn to respect each other. And, and I've not always experienced that. Matter of fact, the battalion that supported my regiment, 3rd Battalion, 11th Marines, we used to call it 4-7, 4th Battalion, 7th Marines. We love those guys so much. I mean, they made our job easy time after time. So uh, I think it's mostly a function of personality and sharing the experience. And, and, it, and it does apply more broadly. Thank so you, no sir. problem. Other questions? I've got one back here on your far right in the back. Oh, I see you back there. We had this discussion in the car on the way in, and that was when you belong to an organization and you're good at taking orders and you're good at leading your group, and you find that the leadership above you seems to be making poor decisions, seems to be giving poor direction, how long do you stay in that spot and try to facilitate change? And when do you quit and go somewhere else that you can have a positive influence? Yeah, it's, it's an, remember you can only quit once, so you've got to exhaust all, all efforts to try to keep the organization on track. <clears throat> I think too that you have to recognize that sometimes you're wrong and so you, you carry out any decision as best you can. Uh, but at the same time, if it becomes a moral decision or an ethical decision, uh, that's an intensely uh, personal, uh, personal decision. And remember, you're going to leave the people below you uh, without their leader. So unless it's something that you find is, I, I would call it ethically 
I, I would add a couple of things. Strategically stupid at, to the extreme, unsupported by the facts, and morally wrong. You, try, you just keep trying to, to get your point across, while at the same time, change how you're doing it and have other people critique you that you respect to make sure that you're giving it your best shot and you're not the one who's off base. Uh, but otherwise, uh, just you know, make sure you, you, you start with your head and then crank in your heart your, your, where you stand on it and your value system uh, because you can only quit once. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I, do one more? All right, right here. Mr. Manager, thank you for representing us. Um, early in your presentation, you talked about um, putting things on the elevator for others to, to see what we're doing. And you talked about the power of affection among your troops. Um, I represent some educators as an educational consultant. How do, how do educators put things like affection on the, eleva on the elevator? for uh, the youth and, and our younger colleagues to, to learn from. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's personal, like, like uh, the legend of Bagger Vance. You've got you to have your own authentic swing on the golf course. You can't sw do it like someone else. But I think especially teachers have a unique opportunity, too, because you can find from almost anyone who's successful. I've never met anyone successful who did not acknowledge the role of teachers. Uh, I, I, I have so many stories along these lines because teachers and coaches, because of the personal relationship to the student or the athlete, <clears throat> they at times can have a different relationship than a parent, but one that is in some ways more telling because they open the youth, uh, the young man or woman, to a broader uh, perhaps a broader world than, than a parent can. A parent is a product of their formative experience too. So they send their kid to school so they can learn the broader world. And the teachers who do that, I think who do it most are ones that show this, they listen and they learn and they help and then they lead. You know, it's, it's remarkable how much I have found what George Washington did is reflected in good coaches and good teachers throughout my life. I will tell you right up front that most of my successes are directly attributed to a specific coach or teacher and what they taught me. And then I integrated them, what they taught me in my own way, but I don't have an original idea in my head. Teachers, I think, can bring it out, and when they help someone like that, have you ever read An Angela's Ashes? Yes. Remember how he's taught? He's, he's exposed to Shakespeare, and all of a sudden he realizes as dirt poor as that Irish kid is, nobody can control his mind. Remember when he finds that out? It's been a while since I've written a course. Sir. Yeah, it, it's worth reading again. Not that I'm going to give you homework. Um, <laughs> but, but for all of you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, it's been a lot of good teachers and coaches. It's the values of this community and everything I was raised with here that allows me to stand up here today, simply another Richland guy who's coming back home and happy to be here. Thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's what a room of 1,000 people standing and clapping sounds like. That's awesome. So much to learn from. Thank you, General Mattis, for those words. And like I said before, uh, we were trying to take away some takeaways from his, his, his words. And I think I ran out of data texting myself the things that you're dropping. And a lot of it is applicable to everyone in our lives. So thank you so much. And a sincere thank you for attending today. On Wednesday, January 29th, it's one of the Chamber's biggest events of the year. It's the Tri-Cities Women in Business Conference. The full-day conference features multiple keynote speakers, breakout presentations, and the Athena Awards Luncheon, which honors two of our top women leaders in this community. Make sure to register early as the event does sell out in advance. You can register right now at tricityregionalchamber.com. Thank you all again for attending today's program. We appreciate your time and what you do. Have a great, wonderful afternoon, and go forward in commerce. Thank you, everyone.